So you, or you should come out last, all right? And then once everybody get this too. Some people supposed to start here at seven o'clock. Correct. Well, not many people interested in maybe the speaker going to come. I could do something else if they're not coming out. They're going to announce it. What? I'm, I'm pretty sure they're here. They're 10 minutes late, aren't they? Fine, so it's nice. Good evening. My name is Boris Van. I'm a freshman at Harvard College. On behalf of the Institute of Politics Forum Committee, it brings me great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the event. As the nation approaches the elections in November, our country seems divided over the many issues at stake with the Iraq war and economic policy seeming dominant but in what seems to be probably one of the closest and most aggressive races in electoral history, campaigns, parties, and their supporters have sought every possible avenue to get their message across, giving 527s, internet bloggers, and even Dan Rather their fair share of influence. <laughs> with 28 days left, it's a great privilege to have with us tonight such a distinguished panel of speakers whose varied experience and expertise in politics will enable them to enlighten us on the many intricacies of the race. Without further ado, let me hand you over to our moderator tonight, who's been a congressman for 20 years in Indiana and the current acting director of the Institute of Politics, Mr. Philip Sharp. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris. And welcome to the John F. Kennedy uh, Junior Forum. Uh, tonight, we, I think, will have an entertaining uh, and hopefully uh, enlightening uh, a discussion uh, given the broad experience of our panel. And so let me quickly introduce them. First is Shelley Cohen uh, to my left here. She uh, joined the Boston Herald staff as the State House Bureau Chief in 1979. Previously, she had covered county government for Middlesex County News Service, where she won citations for excellence for her articles exposing corruption in the county government. She was the first woman president of the State House Press Association here in Boston, and uh, she currently is the Boston Herald's editorial page editor and once a week writes a political column for her paper, Shelley Cohen. Next to Shelley is Stephen Goldsmith, a fellow Hoosier. He, that means he's from Indiana. Um, and uh, he and I understand that. Um, he uh, served for two terms as the mayor of Indianapolis, where he gained a national reputation for innovative uh, activities that he undertook in the government. Uh, during the 2000 presidential campaign, he served as the chief domestic policy advisor to the Bush-Cheney campaign. Currently, he is a professor of the practice in public management, the practice of public management, and he's also a faculty chair of the Kennedy School's Ash Institute for Democratic Governance. Uh, he also serves as chair of the Corporation for National and Community Service and as a special advisor to President Bush on faith-based and not-for-profit not initiatives, Stephen Goldsmith. Next to Steve is Maxine Isaacs. Uh, Maxine has had ex considerable experience in the Washington establishment. Uh, she had worked uh, for a vice president, she'd worked for a US senator, she'd worked for a member of the House of Representatives, and then in the 1984 presidential campaign, she worked for Vice President Walter Mondale as his press secretary and as deputy campaign manager. Since 1994, she's been teaching here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government and in Washington at the George Washington University. She's an adjunct lecturer in public policy, and uh, she teaches a very popular course on the 2004 presidential campaign, Maxine Isaacs. Next to Maxine is Evan Thomas. Uh, he has been an editor of Time Magazine. He was Newsweek's Washington bureau chief, and since 1991 has been Newsweek's assistant managing editor. 
He's a prolific writer. He's written uh, five books, uh, very, without going through all of them, uh, he wrote one on Robert Kennedy, uh, uh, one uh, called The Very Best Men about the early years of the CIA, and uh, one uh, called The Man to See the Life of Edward Bennett Williams. Uh, in fact, last night, if you turned into PBS, uh, you would have seen him featured uh, on a special uh, regarding Robert Kennedy. Uh, currently, he is at the Kennedy School of Government. He is the Shorenstein Center's uh, Edward R. Murrow, a visiting professor uh, of the practice of press and public policy. Uh, Evan Thomas. Uh, next to Evan is Joe Trippi. Uh, Joe started working in politics, we are told, when he was 17. One suspects it happened even earlier than that. In 1984, he was uh, selected by Walter Mondale to manage Iowa's first in the nation caucuses. Uh, he's been a campaign manager for Senate, congressional, gubernatorial, and mayor campaigns. Uh, most recently, of course, he managed Governor Howard Dean's campaign for the presidency. Uh, and in that process, uh, the New Republic uh, uh, indicated that he had reinvented campaigning. In doing so, he, of course, pioneered in the use of online technology to build the most innovative grassroots movement uh, in presidential history. Uh, please welcome Joe Trippi. Well, let me just get us started with a question. I suspect these folks will uh, chime in as they uh, see fit. Uh, first, um, a very pedestrian one, where are we uh, 28 days out? Uh, where does this election stand? Let me just start with Maxine. Well, I think that the election is tied. I think it's been tied since 2000, and I think it's still tied. Um, all of the ups and downs in the polls, most of them are within the margin of error. Is there, are you getting feedback here? Um, and it, I and uh, uh, I think that nothing yet has broken this loose. Um, I suspect that the debates will have a big, big part to play in, in, in breaking it loose. I don't think it's going to, I, I, my guess is it won't be another 2000 in terms of being tied on election day, but that's anybody's guess. Joe, you, you buy that analysis? Oh, yeah, well, it's definitely tied, and I agree with Maxine that it's been that way since 2000. I think. Uh, I think people are stunned at the debate uh, in Miami by uh, not just how Kerry conducted himself, but I think people were surprised about how the president handled that debate. Um, the difference, I mean, th this happened, actually Maxine and I went through this in 84 when Mondale, Walter Mondale creamed Reagan in the first debate. I mean, everybody was just sort of sitting back going, how did that happen? How did the great communicator fall apart? And, and Mondale, who was sort of seen as a sort of stodgier, uh, more careful, cautious politician, come out and, and surprise everybody. And the, it, it, it seemed to be a big sea change, uh, but we know that Reagan won in a landslide. So I, I think the debate was important to sort of getting people to take another look at Kerry. And I think that's an opportunity for him now. Um, but it's going to be a hard fought 28 days. And I, I don't know, I think we couldn't end up with a. Uh, with some, well, the only place I might disagree with Maxine is it is possible that we could be in another, someone wins the popular vote, someone wins the electoral college uh, kind of uh, election if it, if it remains this tight. When Mondale creamed Reagan in, in 1984, he closed the gap to 14 points. So. In other words, people do agree with that theory or that's not just democratic lore? No, that, that I mean, it, it shows how even a, even a very important debate can, can cannot translate into votes. Shall I well, what I love to watch are the, the state by state poll results. And <laughs> we're beginning to see a little movement there. I think the last um, electoral vote uh, tally that I saw was Bush was at 219, uh, Kerry about 170 ish. There's still you know, 150 some up, uh, up for grabs. Um, it, I did see one intriguing result, which was that, Flo that Bush was a moderately ahead in Florida. Still margin of error, but you know, the four points um, getting not to be. Um, I, you know, I think the national polls are almost um, going to be, t t t t t they drive me crazy. Um, but when you start looking at the state by state stuff, um, they, it is beginning to sort itself out a little bit, except of course, we've got the big three, Ohio, Michigan, um, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, absolutely margin of error, and those are just the ones to watch. And I, I, I think there'll be a sorting out of that too um, after, maybe after Friday night. Certainly not after tonight. I don't think that's a, that's that's going to happen real fast. I'd like to know the impact of all this 
voter, voter registration that's going on and how, how the polls do or do not reflect, uh, reflect that. If, if, I'm, if I'm reading the stories right, there's massive Democratic registration in Ohio and some other of these swing states. Less Republican, although certainly the Republicans are working on it. But I can't tell whether the po polls that I'm seeing reflect that or don't reflect it. I mean, you're, Maxine, what, what can The you only thing I, had, I understood was that the registration is way up in the battleground states and, if anything, down in the other states. And so that it, overall, in the end, and, and it may not matter uh, what's going on in the other states, but, but overall, registration may, may, may be sort of... Uh, on, you know, but about, but are the polls, time. when we look at an uh, Ohio poll, <coughs> is it reflecting <laughs> this big surge of registration? Or? Well, what we know, I mean, there's two things we know. First of all, uh, there's a big difference between polls that uh, have been, con and the results between registered voters and likely voters. Registered voters always show Kerry doing much better than polls that are on likely voters. So. In the registered voter polls, theoretically, they would be getting that new register, I mean, that, that surge, because they're only polling registered people and you're on the rolls. Yeah. But what we know is there's a big difference. I mean, often five, six point difference in those polls. The other thing, though, so my, I suspect, no, the likely voter poll, polls are not getting, capturing that, that surge in registration, um, which means Kerry's doing better than, better than, than the, yeah. most of the polls that we're seeing. The, the second thing I think that, people aren't focused on, and pollsters don't talk about this a whole lot, but there are two distinct things going on. Ninety percent of people who are being asked in a poll a question now are declining to, to take part in the poll. Um, and This is a total sea change that's ha happened over the last ten years. I mean, you used to be kind of thrilled that Gallup wanted to know or ABC wanted to know what, what you were thinking. You're now getting to, to only ten percent of the electorate is actually answering the poll and going through the survey. The second thing, actually third thing then, is cell phones. Entire, uh, particularly among young people, and this is where I think they're under, they're not missing something else. Young people, and a lot of lower income people today, have cell phones and not, and not hard lines into their home. Um, they only ha can afford one phone, and they'll pick a mobile over the landline. Pollsters have still not been able to figure out how to get into that, that system. They cannot telephone somebody on a cell phone randomly and start asking them questions. So that whole group, particularly young folks, college kids, um, uh, et cetera, around the country are not in these samples. And, I, and maybe I'm, you know, I think there's much more activity, much more energy within that cohort than I've seen in the, you know, 20, 30, 40 well, years. pro Democrat? I think I think the energy's on both sides, but again, more pro-Democrat. They're more more pro carry and I think the really I think that's being missed too. So if you put the 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 difference between likely voter polling and and uh, 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 registered voter polling, plus add the component that we're in an age where large segments of the population are using cell phones and pollsters can't reach those people. I think you know, and I think that benefits carry. I think this race. Is Kerry's doing a lot stronger than people think. Maybe I, not, I'm not saying strong enough to win yet, but stronger than people think. I, I wouldn't disagree with the you know analysis that the campaign is essentially tied. But I think what makes this conversation complicated. And let's let's take you know in Ohio is a border state to Indiana. So let me just kind of talk local here for a second. Is that and this which makes the, the voter registration difficult to evaluate in terms of turnout is that you know people are anxious about the economy in in uh, Western Ohio. They are anxious about the war. But they're also really anxious about Senator Kerry, right? So it, it, it creates a, uh, it dilutes the intensity. It, it, it not only confuses the decision right, for the undecideds, but it also makes it very difficult to predict which of, the, which of these new registrants, which of these young voters will actually turn out because they may decide, you know, I don't like where the country's going, but I don't like the option either. And that may, may, may reduce the surge down to an increase, but not this, the peak that we see. On the, on the issue of registration, what, one of the things I loved is that, of course, registration, voter registration was always a Democratic plot to Republicans generally. I mean, it was just, it was something that Democrats did and you know, they weren't real sure about it. Well, this time, the Republicans actually got the fact that it was okay to go out there and have voter registration drives. 
Um, and I was actually a, a, astonished to talk to some of their people during the convention um, at the way they had targeted their registration efforts and their post-registration get out the vote efforts. I mean, for the first time, I think, in decades, um, Republicans actually got the fact that it was okay oh. to register people and then to go and follow up and, and actually yeah. offer them a ride to the polls or, uh, and, and of course the other phenomenon is, um, is the, the absentee ballot. And there is the party structures, especially in places like um, Arizona. I mean, mail-in voter registration was pra practically invented in Maricopa County. Um, were they to get it in terms of getting those cards in the hands of their people? Also adding a, a I mean, and as that trend spreads, it, it adds a whole new element, a whole new layer of uncertainty. I'd like to ask uh, Joe's pro pro professional opinion on uh, Carl Rove has got this big turnout operation going, which is supposedly extremely disciplined, that the Republicans, in a way they never have before, have got volunteers. Now, they're volunteers, but all sorts of accountability and test runs and, you know, precinct captains and a very centralized but intense effort to get their people out. I read this Matt Bai's article. Matt Bai, former Kennedy uh, IOP fellow, I think, wrote a good piece about this in the New York Times over the winter. But you're the pro at this. What do you make, what do you make of that? Do you think they're going to, does that sound real to you? Uh, yeah, it, it does. They, they, uh, I mean, I think the first time you actually saw this was uh, uh, 2002 uh, with their 72-hour uh, program where they, they literally, um, you know, clearly drove registration, I mean, uh, excuse me, turnout, not just the registration, but turnout up uh, in 2002 in races all over the country that shocked the Democrats. People, we had been lulled into this, they don't do that stuff uh, for so long that uh, we didn't see it coming. I mean, it, it really uh, was what sort of created that that th feeling of almost a swarm that happened to Democrats in 2002 when so many uh, folks lost unexpectedly and, and uh, uh, the sea change happened. So my, my own view is that I personally think you don't underestimate them. You figure they learned even better than they did in 2002 with their 72-hour program. They seem to have expanded on that, thrown more resources. I mean, they've seen it as a success, therefore, uh, in their party, when you have a success, they tend to throw even more resources and pay even more attention to it. In the Democratic Party, um, if it was an insurgent who had that, that kind of a success, they tend to view it as flaky and a fad and weird and, and, not, and not put so much into it. So uh, uh, I would actually say, no, I'd be very worried about that. I am worried about it from a Democratic perspective. But don't you think it's also had a counter reaction in the Democratic Party? Uh, this time around, they're very painfully aware of that experience, and therefore that's why you have renewing Americans their coming efforts together in the same these way. other yeah, organizations. Exactly. I think we're almost <laughs> a, a democratic reaction to that, and that's what the great unknown now is that both parties have, I think, for the first time, actually thrown massive resources at this registration and get out the vote stuff. The one thing I would caution, though, is they have had. I mean, no doubt that the Republicans have had this registration drive going. The register, when you poll registered voters, carry opens up a big, uh, opens up, uh, either closes the gap or actually opens up a lead on, on Bush. So that you would, theoretically, you would believe that they're cap if, if they're capturing the new Democratic surge in registered voters, they've also captured the new Republican surge in Democratic voters, I mean Republican voters. So it would seem to me that if you look at that, at least in terms of registration, the, Repub the Democrats have, have done a better job of it. I'm not saying the Republicans aren't getting very good at it, but the Democrats still have some kind of edge if you look at the registered voter polling. I, I what I find that, interesting is this is just old-fashioned organizational politics right. that we're going for two centuries in this country, right. which kind of went out of style, uh, which both political parties where they were effective did extremely well with old-fashioned little polling books and things of that sort. Now, today it's a lot easier to organize. Right. And for a while we went through a period when people thought, oh, just go to television and that's what matters, that's what moves people and we can, and, and we're now returning to uh, some very serious personal organization, which by the way takes more people to engage in the political process. The interesting thing in this election, the modern wrinkle on that old process is that, and, and talking about what Joe was saying about the difference between registered voters and likely voters, is that the big debate among 
pollsters is, what, what do we think the turnout is likely to be? Exactly. And a lot of people think that it's going to be, my colleague Tom Patterson over at Jornstein thinks it's going to be very high. It could be, could be close to 60%, which for this country, as we know, is very high. If you think the turnout is high, you go for the registered voter number, and you, and you think that that's more reflective of what's, what you're going to see at the polls on election day. Some of, the, some of the polling organizations, however, are very conservative, and so they put these screen they call them screens, to try to determine who the likely voters will be. Gallup has seven screens before you can be considered a likely voter. I think Pew has six. And so you end up uh, 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 shrinking the electorate to get your poll results, and that's what you get as likely voters. And that's what, that's what a lot of this debate is, is about. It, and, is, it rests on your prediction about the turnout. And I would offer up as uh, a cautionary note on uh, that the higher turnout may be correct. Uh, just the viewership of Miami, the Miami debate, uh, which was an unheard of number of Americans, something like 64 million Americans tuned in to watch that debate, 34 percent increase over the Gore-Bush debates of, uh, of 2000. So, if, I mean, there, there seems to be, I mean, I would take that as, you know, evidentiary that something else is going on there, that this is going to be a higher turnout election, and that all these efforts are Maybe, maybe it's an indication people are sick and tired of all the advertising would like to see for themselves what <laughs> What's the heck these on? guys yeah. are like. <laughs> also, wasn't that number 65 million still below the 92? 92 number? was, I, I, I wrote down these numbers and uh, uh, the high point was uh, 92 was 62.4. I'm not sure if that's households though or, or people. Um, and what was voter turnout like? The con but if, you're, if you make it uh, not, 55. 55 percent, 105 million. And what was turnout in 2000? Um, also, 105 million, but 50, it was 52 percent. Because the population has been growing. Right. In the well, let me ask you. We we mentioned a few items. What what things are different about this or new in this presidential election compared to the past? I mean, Joe, you've been involved in so-called bloggers and, and the internet and whatnot. Uh, to what degree is that new? Well, and, from that point of view, almost everything's different. I mean, I mean everything from not just how the campaigns have begun to conduct themselves, but also, I mean, just going to CBS in 60 Minutes, how fast, um, and this comes from sites on the Republican side of the aisle, freerepublic.com, 19 minutes into Dan Rather's report to question uh, President Bush, use documents questioning uh, George Bush's National Guard Service, 19 minutes, the thing hadn't been over yet. And there was a detailed reasoning as to why those documents were fake that, that holds up to this day as the first uh, just debunking of the report, um, uh, which then spread within four hours all over the internet, jumped to the Drudge Report, which is viewed by millions of people, which is also read by a lot of media outlets, and that just leapt it off and into the mainstream media. So you're you're, you're, it's not just the, the change that's occurring with hundreds of thousands of people getting involved in politics again in uh, different ways that happened in the Dean campaign, the way both Bush and, and uh, Kerry are using the internet today, but just also its impact on, on how the media uh, has to react and, and, and cover what's, uh, what's going on. I mean, I, and we're, I, think, I believe we're just at the nascent stages of this, that it's going to have an even bigger impact uh, in 2006 and 2008 than it's having today. You know, for those of us who look for uh, silver linings and everything, there was a Scripps Howard poll, it was about a month old, but it said that uh, something like 40% of the undecided persuadables watched Fox News, right? <laughs> so um, uh, it's probably an extension of and Joe's And that will comment. help your cause, is that what you're saying? I would hope it help our <laughs> cause, yeah. But, but, uh, but more importantly, uh, this, this uh, proliferation of sources of information and the fact that uh, the, the, the country, you know, the campaign's tied because the country is polarized. May be the wrong word, but but it's you know, folk, people have certain sorts of habits. You know, think one way or another. And they also are reinforcing those habits by their choices in in where they consume their news, and 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 uh, that kind of reinforcement uh, uh, creates both bad and good as it relates to these issues. And I, I think that's a pretty substantial change. Maybe even over four years ago in terms of that kind of reinforcing proliferation of news. Which also, I assume, allows the campaign and its advertising to more clearly focus and capture an audience. And one of the hardest problems is to know 
whether you're reaching the audience you want to reach. Well, look at that whole genre of um, internet-based advertising um, that will never see the light of day on your TV or mine, um, but anybody can log on to it through the campaigns. And it, it sort of, it's that, it's um, the whole immediacy of uh, being able to call up a speech, watch the candidate give whatever speech of the day in its entirety um, and at your convenience. Um, and go back and find it. And go back and, um, so it makes our job that much more, you know, those of us who actually work for daily newspapers, it makes our job a little trickier, which means we're looking for the new, different, exciting angle. We're looking for the, the column, the commentary. Um, which then gets picked up by the ca one campaign or another, and it, it just it's, a, it's an interesting cycle we find ourselves in, but with the internet uh, very much at the center of it. One, one thing that was sort of, sort of discouraging, or at least uh, worrisome to us practitioners of old media, if you follow the Swift Boat story, it's a low, small ad buy, gets out into cable, uh, and on the internet, and has a couple of weeks running out there. And the Kerry campaign thought that they could fight back by getting old media, the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Boston Globe, to do investigative stories on the Swift Boat guys. Well, it took a couple of weeks to get that story done, because it takes a couple of weeks to do a story like that. Finally, the Post and the Times and the Globe did run stories, serious stories, raising questions about the Swift Boat guys, and everybody patted themselves on the back on that. It was too late. Two weeks into this process was just too late. The mainstream media really didn't have much impact, even though they were doing their watchdog role of trying to be responsible and do the right thing and dig down and what are really the facts, which is a worthy thing and we all ought to be doing. But as far as I can tell, they might as well have been shouting in a darkened forest because nobody noticed. The damage had been done by two constant weeks of wallpaper of that ad playing over and over again, not just on Fox, but on CNN, which is trying to compete with Fox and losing to Fox and got to keep up with Fox, so they run the, run the same stuff, and on, on all, and, and on the internet. And again, for us old media types, it was kind of a jarring moment where it was, it, you could feel a, a hint of our relevancy, <laughs> chilling uh, feeling of what are we doing here. This is called discipline on the process. I think, I think the most, in, in answer to your question, I think the most interesting thing about this year is the, is the number of people who are paying attention and who have been paying attention For since March. Um, uh, back, back in March, you know, after, after, around the time of Super Tuesday, as many people were paying attention, as paid attention in 2000 to presidential politics, 10 days out, and they have just sat there watching since that time. And there have been a few dips, but basically they're right there. And nobody knows quite what to make of it or what the effect of that is going to be, um, but it's definitely different. And I think that, you know, I think when we look back on it, we're going to say, we're going to say that that may have been the most interesting part about, about the 2004 election. It certainly well, seems by all indications that we have much greater engagement yeah. by citizens and, in and this I always say it's not because they love yet. presidential politics, they don't. No, it's because no. they're worried and they then they feel they're feeling vulnerable uh -huh. and they just they just aren't they don't feel secure enough to walk away from it. I actually think there were huge peaks and valleys. I mean, thanks to Joe's candidate, uh, there was a, a lively, exciting primary season. And then once that nomination was locked up, I think Actually interest. not. There's some new numbers on it which show that they've, they've paid either, well, mostly very close attention to the, I'm talking about 60, 70 percent of the people saying they've been following since March. A little dip around in August, but that was basically it. I'll, show, I'll send you the numbers. Yeah, it's I'd fascinating. Be, I'd be, I'd be yeah. really surprised yeah. at that because from, from the time the nomination was locked up, there was so... Well, there was so little coverage. There was re precious little for them to pay attention to. That's, we had a president, that's one of the things that's interesting. Yeah, about that we it. had a president who was, you know, off conducting a war. We had a candidate who sort of was making cameo appearances, um, and I don't know what there was out there to engage them. The, don't you think it also internet. reflects an intensification of people's view of the value of government? or its importance, either as a positive or negative, to them. In other words, I think we went through a period when there was an increasing diminishment of people's view as to how relevant 
the federal yeah, government, but, especially but, was to their lives. But it also reflects the fact, I think, that uh, people of one persuasion can't possibly figure out rationally how anybody could be on the other, other side, side, right? I mean, and, and it's just either side, right? It's just you can't comprehend it. So you're, you're intense, you're involved, it's reinforcing you. I mean, and, and it's, you know, it has its own, it may have a positive effect in terms of voter turnout. It seems to have a negative effect in terms of governance and, you know, how we operate as a country. But I, I think that's quite different. I mean, it obviously we, see it, we saw it start four years ago, but it seems to me that it's, it's greatly intensified and, and it causes people um, you know, whether you watch Fox, you're on Fox or CNN, it causes you to just be uh, irate and involved, right? Which is not necessarily what blood pressure right. in the country is much higher. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I think that that really did a lot of damage um, uh, to whether you want to call it old media or whatever the, the term is for it was, and again, it was TV that did it um, for a lot of people was the coverage of the war. Uh, at the initial stages. I mean, when, when, when you're, you're tuning in and the, the coverage is called, you know, CNN's shock and awe, or I can't remember, they, they all had their own sort of thunderous, positive, uh, cool uh, uh, slogan for it. And, and I think that really drove a lot of people to start seeking information somewhere else. I mean, it, it actually helped fuel the blogosphere and actually created <laughs> place where people who, who wanted to, this is, where, where, where were they in August? They were, you know, on, on their blog where they, they, they were, you know, starting to read stuff that they, they think the mainstream media uh, somehow missed the boat, somehow just followed along. And I'm not getting into whether you were for war against war. I'm, I'm not talking my point. I'm talking about how I think what happened. We could see it in the Dean campaign where suddenly uh, blogs like the Daily Cause, it was a nice little quaint little 20,000 people read it a, a week. It ballooned to 1.4 million readers a week. I mean, it, and, and Forbes magazine is calling it the best blog for war news at the time. Um, and so what I, what I was sort of watching happening was as, as all the networks and all the cable shows were all sort of um, you know, riding along in the vehicles and doing that sort of, uh, you know, sort of positive reporting on what was going on. And this was still at a time when most of the country was for it. So I'm not, people started, the, the blog readership just started skyrocketing on any blog that was for or against the war, but just giving different, tid, different sort of looks into that war in a different way than they were getting from sort of all of a sudden what looked almost like the same thing. Probably even, for the first few weeks in the magazine, news magazines probably had very similar covers and very similar things. And people, so today you're sitting here and the top four blogs combined have a, have a greater readership than the New York Times. Now, the campaigns. Four, four blogs. Yeah, have a larger readership on a daily basis than the New York Times. And so we all, you're suddenly in a world from a campaign side, we, I mean, we were ahead of this in the Dean campaign, but you know, I would never not return Evan's call, <laughs> or somebody, you know, or, or Adam Nagorny from the New York Times, or J Jody Wilgoran, who's even, you know, who in a campaign or, or a, you, you know, <laughs> is, yeah. is thinking about contacting the, the four top bloggers, giving them an interview, or somehow yeah. trying to well, get... Well, now you know why I'm nervous, because <laughs> they're going to stop returning our phone calls if they figure out... <laughs> yeah. Well, there are some other things that have, have changed. I mean, like the, some of the finance rules have changed. We have the 527s sure. that have come into play. We have a lot of voting ballot procedure changes around the states, so the computer voting, and, and that new thing called the provisional ballot, uh, which may well mean that we have more challenge and recounts I don't know whether that's possible. Do these matter? Are they really different? Or are they just different channels of the same old things we've seen election after election? Or do you know? I mean, I, I, well, I mean, the, I, I am fascinated by the rise of the, the so-called absentee ballot, um, <coughs> only because I did see it um, 96, maybe, when it was, when it was kind of a born in. Uh, and it has just taken off. Uh, and, and of course, we also have the motor voter, which made the whole registration process easier. Um, it's, it's intriguing. I think people are, the fact that people are voting, have voted, is a little scary. Um, but so much for our undecided voters. I mean, they're, they're out there. They really don't care 
uh, or the you know the decided voters um, could care less of what's going to happen in the debates. This is strictly for entertainment value. Um, but I, I wanted to, to ask Joe a question about the the bloggers because one of the the things that was that, that fascinates me is sort of the rise of the talking heads. And I'm just wondering if the bloggers are a kind of counterbalance to people's general g annoyance with the talking heads on CNN and Fox, because they're always just at each other, and a lot of heat, not a lot of light. And uh, no, I, yeah, I think you have a, there's a feeling that there's a much broader debate, uh, a much actually more civil debate um, and we're, it, first of all, you've got the written word in a blog, so you can actually, somebody can post for four or five paragraphs what they really think about the war, and, and a, a, an opposing commenter can come on and do likewise, which you can't do on, on television, which is the, the big problem. But I also think the other thing that um, is, is going on in the blogosphere is that um, they, they, they wear their view on their sleeve. I mean, they don't try to say like Fox does that it's fair and balanced. I mean, you, you know, no, and I don't mean, I mean, but you know that they've got a slant and a beat and that's what it is and they wear it on their sleeve. And the other thing, so you, you know, we're smart folks and you can go to that blog, you know where this guy's coming from, so you take what he says and you, you know, and you understand that. The, the, the other thing that's different, though, is how fast they have to correct. The second they get it wrong, they, if they don't correct it immediately, a misstatement or something that they said wrong, they have thousands of people, I mean thousands of people, who are correcting them for them. And they have to come on in five or ten minutes and say, you're right, I screwed up, I've gone and done some research, you're right, this is what really happened. That instantaneous correction and the way they do it, where it's, it's a full you know, regurgitation of what they just did and why they were wrong and how they were wrong, is something that the New York Times, the Boston Herald, can't do. Be I mean, you get, you're lucky if you, I mean, I know the paper wants to correct itself, so I'm not, I'm with you on this, but you got like that one inch thing where you go, we were wrong on Friday when we said Joe Trippi's name was with an E, it's with an I, or whatever you do. But so my, what's, <laughs> what's interesting thing about the blogosphere is it's actually a more, in a weird way, a more perfect self-correcting vehicle um, than, than, than any of the mediums we have because you can't change your story in real time. You can't come, you know, you, it, Dan Rather did it. It just got beamed out to millions of Americans and he's not on again for another the show's not on again for another week. Well, it sounds like this may become a new yeah. discipline for the mainline media. Yeah, it's too. really, I mean, it's it's really, really and that's where I do think it could be, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's unclear to me yet um, how the mainstream or old, old we'll adjust. politics, I don't like that word, but how, that's gonna, how it's going to adjust, but it's going to have to because this isn't going, in, you know, the, it's not, the genie's not going back in the bottle. Well, let's talk a moment about the vice presidential thing. It's coming up with this debate in a few minutes. Uh, not turning to the debate at first, just what do you think the impact of either one of these folks, Pre Vice President Cheney or, or Senator Edwards, is on the presidential race and what's happening now? To what degree are they contributing or detracting from their, uh, the heads of their team? This is, a, what, what night of the week is this today? Tuesday. 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 I think it, have a, it could have a great effect until Friday. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, right, so you have another presidential debate, and I mean, right. it, you know, the, you, everybody in the room has read about kind of this vice presidential debate is different than the others, and it probably is in the sense that, I mean, uh, the momentum has shifted, and it's kind of an interesting time. But then again, there is a presidential debate on Friday, and, and um, uh, depending on how the candidates uh, uh, beat up their, their opposite presidential candidates, it could have a small effect. But it, I mean, in the end, it's hard to believe that people will vote for a uh, vice president vote for a, a, a slate because they like the vice president candidate and not the president candidate. So I, I mean, I think it'd be an interesting moment for about 72 hours. But you're, you're assuming they'll watch the 
the debate instead of the Yankees game, which is a Well, I'm not sure the people, I'm not sure it makes any difference <laughs> whether people watch the debate so much as what people write about what happened in the debate. You know, they, I'm, they, they, you know I've assumed that twice as many people claim they watch the debate who actually did. They watch the, the baseball game and then read about it and feel like they watch the debate. So it, might, it would have a little bit of an effect in that way, perhaps. But obviously well, you articulated the role that their, their role is simply to beat up on the other guy's presidential candidate, the other team's okay. presidential I'll, candidate. I'll venture yes. a prediction, because I think that there, a lot of people will watch. Um, I think that the number will be at least as great as the number who watched the debate in two thousand, the first presidential debate in 2000, which was <coughs> a huge number, but it was 42 million. Um, and that debate had, an, as you remember, had a huge impact on the, on the election. I think, I think that, there, that the number will be fairly high tonight, despite the Yankees game. And, um, but that, you know, I could be proven wrong in, in a few moments, so we'll see. Um, I, the, uh, some vice presidential debates have had an impact. I mean, I think the, the debate in 2000 had, had an impact on that race between Lieberman and Cheney. Um, the, Do you really? Oh, yeah. Lasting effect? Uh, well, it, was, it, was, it, it all contributes. And I think when you're in a tied situation, you, can, you look back and you say that, that could have been something okay. you know, that made a difference. Well, most people um, say that Cheney gave Bush gravitas in, in the 2000 election. Uh, or, or that, or, I guess, Lieber, yeah. yeah, that Lieberman, that, Lieberman sort of gave it away, and Cheney, and Cheney helped Bush a lot. And, and, and that, that contributed to, to, to some of Bush's success. And the, uh, the, you know, we can all, I mean, I remember you know, the benson Quayle debate, of course, had, had, a, had an impact on that race. Probably not decisive in terms of the outcome, but but certainly a, a, a flavor to the race. Um, the, the, the one I remember very clearly, the Mondale-Dole debate in 1976, going way back, uh, uh, may, have, may have had a, a, an impact on the outcome. So you, you, don't, you just don't know. I think Cheney's job now, it, I think it's interesting to think about that Cheney has such an interesting, his job became so much more complicated a, a, after the Thursday night debate, I think. And it's interesting to think about how he's going to handle that. Um, I, I agree. I think one thing that conceivably could happen, maybe Cheney's too smart for this, but if he does his Darth Vader routine and he's just too dark, <laughs> it's gonna, it, that could be a problem. I mean, because it could, there is some momentum involved in these things. And if, if, if the president's peevish and, and Cheney's dark, eh, you know, these things have a way of, of at least in the press, taking on momentum. Now, because it's so obvious that he can't afford to be that way, I don't think he's going to be that way. But they're going to try to, you know, you can be sure that Edwards is going to try to push him in that direction and, and make him sound dark and gloomy. And, and, uh, and, and, and uh, presumably the, question, the questions will try to elicit that. So we'll see which Cheney shows up, whether it's the kind of moderate seeming reasonable one who we saw against Lieberman in, in 2000. <laughs> supposed to be fair, fair and even handed would even seemingly reasonable. <laughs> uh, or whether it's the, 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 the vice president we've seen make pretty dark speeches. I don't, I don't think you're going to see a warm and fuzzy Dick Cheney because I don't think there is a warm and fuzzy Dick Cheney. <laughs> but there is a I mean, humorous Dick Cheney. Is there, there, is a, there is a funny yeah. Dick Cheney. There's a wry Dick Cheney. There's a, there's a more benign Dick Cheney. I agree with Evan on that. There's a, he's, and he, you saw it at the convention, at their convention, the way they, the way he, uh, just the one up there in New York, he, you saw more of that, that Dick Cheney. I don't know where they put him <laughs> most of the time, but he does, he is there. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, there's another polling anomaly on this. I've been watching this, poll, which is in interesting. Uh, when they ask uh, whether you're going to vote for Bush or Kerry, there's uh, Bush, uh, Kerry does much better than in a, in a poll that asks Bush, Cheney, Kerry, Edwards. Um, Edwards actually, when, when th that combination is added, the Bush Cheney ticket pulls away another three or four points. It's another, which by the way, we can all go crazy doing this because now we're trying to figure registered voters that mention the, the <laughs> ticket, which polls right. But there, there is, um, there, Cheney does add, and that's surprising to me because I would have uh, thought otherwise, particularly with uh, Cheney tends to have huge, uh, fairly sizable negative ratings. But for some reason, Bush Cheney does better than John Kerry Edwards. Uh, well, it, it shows you what morons we are in the press. I mean, all those stories we ran about is Bush going to dump Cheney. 
Right. He's a drag on the ticket. You're telling us he's actually. Yeah, net if plus. you look at every single poll that just does the two top names versus the ticket, Bush does better in the ticket questions, not in the. the I mean, yeah, in the end, though, really in, a, in a debate, I mean, I do think the fact that the vice president has this enormous reservoir of knowledge and expertise uh, in this particular format will be uh, will be very helpful um, and will come out and 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 come out in a way. I mean, his demeanor when he, he said some talks knowledgeably, I don't think comes across as that threatening, and I think that the public will see that. I think tonight's debate is going to be probably one of the more fascinating things we've ever, if, if it plays out, um, that we've seen, because I think Cheney embodies um, in a way that Bush doesn't um, the, the, the sort of a, underneath the just underneath the surface, attacks that have been waged on Bush, uh, um, a, a, an administration, and go through them, an administration that lets the oil companies draft our energy policy, uh, the Halliburton no bid contracts when he was a CEO, the Halliburton, I'll do the other side in a second. Um, um, all this sort of corporate ownership of government, having too much control and too much influence on our government. The other side of that, is a guy who, a, a trial attorney who was, will say he was going after the corporate bad guys anytime they abused their power or misabused um, workers or, or, uh, or folks out there. He was always on the little guy's side. The other side of that, though, is the underlying thing that they've been doing to Edwards all since he was the nominee. The ambulance chasing a uh, guy who made a bunch of bucks uh, with frivolous lawsuits. But what, I, what I'm saying there is in that whole atmospherics is a whale of a debate if these two guys actually go, you know, go after um, the chinks in each other's armor along sort of those economic lines. And it, and it may well be that one of the reasons Kerry picked Edwards is that he, he does to, do a, to, those two guys actually juxtapose the two big debates that are going, uh, sort of targets. I mean, once you get past Vietnam and right. who served in the guard and all that, what, what it really is about is these two different ways of governing, and they're really embodied in these two guys. And, uh, and I think there could be a whale of a debate if they actually don't do just the surface stuff, but actually get into to the, to, you know, to why did you do that, why are you for that, and defend themselves. It could be, uh, have a big impact on this election. Not surprisingly, the um, uh, Bush campaign came out today with ads on medical malpractice and tort reform. That, that's what I'm, that's my point. I think it, <laughs> so. There, there. That's what I'm saying. So if if, if Cheney effectively runs this guy as an ambulance chaser, and the ads are out there doing tort reform, and every healthcare is high because of these guys, we could see a much bigger impact debate and who a VP is than we've seen in the past. So likewise, if Edwards can really stick make stick to Cheney that you guys are letting the oil companies write our energy policy. You got the, I mean and make that stick. No, I'm not I'm not arguing who's gonna make no, what no, stick. I'm, I'm just I saying always, that the, I'm I'm shaking that, my head uh, not because I disagree with your analysis, but because I think it's more likely the vice president will run will debate Senator Kerry tonight than Senator Kerry. Well, yeah, he's gonna or, yes, or right. try to boost exactly. up Bush yeah. in terms of I've been with yeah, I think they're both their guns are going to be. But it's going to be very. I think this is actually going to be, I in a lot of ways a more meaningful debate than the one we saw in Miami. Well, it's possible they're most both of them more articulate than the. Uh, more, the, more. the, the <laughs> well, no, we the talk candidate. about it's obvious. You know, it should have been obvious to the Bush folks that Bush couldn't be the guy that was there. So sometimes you know you learn. I mean, I it should have been obvious to me that, that my guy shouldn't go scream right after the Iowa thing. I mean, it, it, sometimes the obvious doesn't happen in politics. And, uh, um, well, but, but yeah. you, you, all of you, so three of you, certainly have been so involved in politics. This whole question of the peevish look on, on Bush, do you suppose, and I just haven't seen any reporting on this, do you suppose his handlers did say, don't look that way, and he just, or they didn't say it, and he, or he didn't no, anyway? No, that's mine. First of all, I, I, I mean, that's As a mine, former candidate in many elections, let me just suggest that free will and spontaneity yeah. still has a role. Yeah. And despite all of the analysts and the handlers, they just can't handle human beings. They have a way of doing oh, their thing that, and, and even coming up with their own ideas every now and then. It's, it's, I know it's strange to some of you folks, but it does happen. Here's what I think. I think they told him not to do that, and I think Kerry was told Get under his skin as fast as you can. And you could see 10 minutes into the debate, 
where Carrie just sort of st stuck it to him a little bit, not in any way that the audience, but the, the president took the bait and started getting away with him. And, and Howard Dean was a lot like that, by the way. I mean, you could, you, could, you could tell him what you thought, and he'd listen to you, and he'd go, you're right. And then you'd just pray that, you know, that, they, that's, that Carrie or Edwards or somebody didn't just that's, that's my touch point. the right nerve to sort of undo all that. That's Most of these people, you know? it doesn't matter how competent they are, yeah. they cannot stay on track when they're being pummeled with questions, they're being expected to do 10,000 things in this debate and, and you know, carry one message in theory. If they carry only one message in the debate, then everybody criticizes them for being too stupid to be right. able to answer anything else. <laughs> so, I mean, it just isn't that simple in my view. Yeah. I, I think these people actually end up, uh, you know, the rules make a difference and whatnot and, and the recommendations, but in the end, we do begin to see more what these people are like. And, by the way, I tend to believe that's where the citizens, where, where again the analysis is, is it Iraq, is it jobs, is it this or that. For many citizens, I think they're making a judgment that just these things come together, just as they judge their neighbors or the minister or whoever in their community. I mean, they, they're looking for these signs. So I, I think it's, there's a little too much science written into this thing <laughs> and not enough recognition that these are human beings. Well, but that's the other interesting thing I think sometimes about a debate is it undoes a lot. Of, it, you can, it, it's like the rap on Dean was, you know, intemperate, intemperate, intemperate. So if he ever has an intemperate moment, if he ever yells it, it's right. been laid down for nine right. months right. that right. he's an intemperate guy. He has that one moment. It, it just sort of sure. catalyzes it for everybody. And I think that's some of what happens in a debate is these campaigns have laid down tracks for months about the other side. And two things, in, in Kerry's instance, he didn't fulfill the role. I mean, we all, were, including the press, was he can't complete a sentence in two minutes. Um, there, you know, I mean, right. and here, gosh, he was speaking English for two minutes, <laughs> ending on time. No, but I mean, so a lot of the sort of track that was laid down on him sort of got, and the, one of the reasons I think he won was he just, wasn't the guy in that debate that right. the other side and a lot of us had, uh, had thought him to Why don't we open it up to uh, our audience and see if they have some uh, questions. If you'll come to the microphones, two here and two up there. We do ask that you quickly identify uh, yourself and, uh, and try to keep a question is usually one sentence with a question mark at the end of it. You may direct it at any member of the panel if you wish and we'll try to make sure everyone gets in. Yes, uh, uh, two quickies. Why is... Uh, Cheney's health, an out-of-bounds question for the press, seeing he's had four major heart situations. And two, how much impact do you think these latest comments by Bremer and Rumsfeld in the last 24, 48 hours will have on the uh, debate tonight and on the election? Well, you can be sure that Edwards will use the comments. Rumsfeld and Bremer will be quoted tonight. You, you'll, you'll hear that thrown right at Cheney, so that, that'll be front and center. On the health thing, I'm trying to remember what we've written about uh, his health. Um, you know, it does get covered. That, I mean, it's not that it's been uncovered. I, we haven't hammered away at it. It may be because fires need oxygen and we need new information, and, and Cheney, simply by not releasing any more than he already has, hasn't done anything to feed it. So we're not going to do stories that just repeat what we already wrote about them. He was saying he's a high-risk candidate, according to Cardinal. But I think we wrote that at the time, but nothing new has happened to make us write it again. And it's been that way for four years. It, so. You know, and the uh, the other thing is, I, don't, I just from the non, you know it. It, I can't imagine the the Kerry Edwards campaign raising. In other words, if, if the other campaign isn't going to raise it, it kind of and, and it, nothing's happened to to change the equation. It's it's kind of almost un, inappropriate. I think. I mean, not inappropriate is not the right word, but there's you're starting to get the press to try to do some work for you that that if you're not willing to do it yourself or raise it yourself. I mean, they could try to do it by Edwards running around. You know, running 10 miles a day or something. I mean, yeah. sort of raise it uh, uh, that way. Well, the, and, and the other issue, of course, is the, the very basic one of does it matter? You know, does anybody really vote for vice president if he keeled over, you know, af the day after inauguration? Is that a problem? I mean, 
That's sort of the way, you know, that's the way many Americans feel about right, most of the yeah. politicians. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name's John. I'm a student at the college. I just wanted to know if you could speak from your experience if there are trends and what t tends to swing uh, the undecided voters in the last month before the election, if it's local campaigning or big news stories or the debates, or if there's just it's something totally different every election. The, the one uh, trend that is different in presidential politics than any other level of campaign, governor, Senate, House, anything down ballot, undecided almost always break to the challenger against an incumbent. Um, for president, that is the opposite. Uh, there's been one that I'm aware of. Um, um, in something like the last 20 presidential elections, undecided broke to the incumbent every time except once, I believe. And um, there's, a, there's a real easy explanation for this, is that um, people tend, you're looking at your congressman, and you don't think you like him very much, and you don't really like the, the new guy either. Um, and if you make a mistake and the new guy gets in, though, like so what? it's one of four, so what? And you want to change things? You know, you just want to do so. And so ten, what tends to happen is the world's not coming in to an end if I make a mistake and put this new guy in who may not seem to have the right experience. I'm worried about it. In a, in a presidential, that does not happen, particularly in wartime. Um, if there's any doubt at all about the challenger, and I'm undecided, they will tend, and I'm just guarantee you, they will tend to vote for the president. It's just, that has nothing to do with George Bush or, or Kerry. I mean, I could go through this every time. The, I think, and I think the one time it moved the other way was it was a landslide situation. The, Reagan or whoever's gonna win anyway, he's got this huge lead. I wanna, you know, sort of do a protest and tell him, eh, and vote the other way. I, I can't remember which, if it was Mondale, Reagan, but there was one time when it broke that I remember it broke away. I think that's reinforced by this uh, uh, leadership gap on the polling, right? I mean, even though uh, you know Senator Kerry has an edge in the economy and you know the war is closer, but on the leadership issue, there's a, there's a big gap in the polling, uh, and I think that tends to reinforce the, what Joe said in terms of predictions. Yes. Hello, and thank you for coming. I just wanted to ask you, what do you think is the most essential thing for running an effective campaign? <laughs> that, that question has bedeviled professionals <laughs> for 400 years, but go ahead. Take I think you should it. answer that one. No. <laughs> I'm sorry to jump in every time, but um, it's to have a campaign, a candidate and a campaign staff that 100% trust each other uh, have no doubts in each other and um, in our unit. And um, Mondale's campaign didn't win, but it was very much like that. Um, I'm not saying there weren't squabbles, but we had a, a strong chairman uh, who had the trust of the candidate and all the way down. Uh, the Dean campaign was a disaster. Um, I mean, I, because there were warring factions, the candidate wouldn't pick between the warring factions. I think part of this is why Kerry's campaign was was such a mess for so long. I mean, when you, the, the Bush campaign operates as a unit, they trust each other, they have faith in each other. If Karl Rove says something, it's done, unless the president you know, says, no, I don't agree with that. I mean, the candidate always has the ability to change that, but when you have these sort of a candidate who listens to, to, to Bob Schrum for four days and then listens to some other operative for the next four days, it, sent, it makes the candidate look more, I mean, the whole campaign look mushy, not execute, and I think that was, I think, a problem for the Kerry campaign for a large part of the way until recently. I think they figured that out and, and are now, you know, full steam ahead with one, sort of one direction, but that, I, that'd be what I think it is. I think the most important thing is get a candidate who belongs in the office, and it'd be amazing the impact that has on the American public. They kind of like it. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I lost my track. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ted. I'm a resident here in uh, Cambridge. Um, you started off the talk tonight talking about how the polls are pretty much uh, tied right now. Um, and you're not seeing the big swings that you saw in past elections. I'm talking like more around the 80s when you had Reagan and Mondale or Bush won against Dukakis. And there have been some convincing arguments made that the reason why you're not seeing the shifts is that 
the country is really embedded more in a cultural uh, clash where you have secular progressives and religious fundamentalists and that the two candidates can talk until they're blue in the face about who has a better health care plan or how they're going to handle the war in Iraq, but really people are really entrenched on something a lot deeper as far as a candidate they believe in, and therefore that's why you have this pretty even split. I was wondering if you could all elaborate a little more about that concept. Can I posit another theory on that? Sure. And that's that um, American elections by and large are won, lost, settled, <laughs> decided, right there in that blissful center. Um, I don't see, y y we can talk about red and blue states till we're blue in the face. Um, I don't see this as a great cultural divide. I don't even see it as a great partisan divide. I see this as a clash of two very committed, very smart, very well advised men, and I think most of the American public has a sense of that. Um, and that's why they tune in the debates. They're hoping to see a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it, you know, but I, um, yeah, I, I just don't agree with that sort of great cultural divide theory. I think we're right there in the middle where we've always been. Uh, Joe or Steve may, be able, may know more about this than I do, but I think that there's a structural explanation for why we're at what the academics call partisan parity at the moment. It has to do with the fact that the the uh, older generation is, is, is going, and, uh, and, and they tended to be more democratic, and, there are, and, the, and the younger generation that's coming up tends to be more Republican, and there's some, there's some structural reason why we're at that point that, that, that really doesn't have to do with, with you know, cultural wars or things like that. But it's, it's I don't it, know, it's a, it, Well, bo both things are true. Um, there is a cultural thing going on. I mean, you can see it in just the this, this same, the way the Democrats still can't get anything going in the South. Uh, I mean, so there's a cult there, and that is a cultural divide, I think, between how Democrats tend to speak and also, but it's also structural. If you don't campaign there, if you write the whole place off, never spend a dollar there, never try to communicate to anybody, you can't, you can't change the equation. But the other, what, what Maxine said is true. There's a whole bunch of different sort of structural things going in terms of the population, where it is. Um, that, that, that's creating this, this parity. But the, the bigger fundamental thing that's going on is we are also entering a stage where uh, 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 the, the artifact of the Electoral College and a, what should have probably not been seen much of a mistake until recently um, is to have the Electoral College roamed on two senators and a, how many House members you have. Um, that's been masked by history, we haven't seen the mistake present itself, but it happened in, in 2000. And what's going on here is states like California have millions of voters. Idaho has almost nothing. They have two electoral votes in Idaho for the senator and two in California for the senator. So what you're gonna see here, I think, I think not only do we have these structural reasons for, uh, for parity happening right now, but at the same time, you've got a situation where um, literally a bunch of dinky states outvote big states like California in terms of the Electoral College because of this, this anomaly in how we count the electoral votes. I actually think we're now in for a long haul of, uh, and I'm not saying necessarily this election, but it's inevitable that you're going to have lots of times someone winning the popular vote by a large margin, by a million, two million votes, and still lose the Electoral College because of this. And, and it's probably going to take two or three times for everybody to wake up and go, oh man, we, we, we've got to change this the way we were counting back then. In the first 13, when we had these states, they were all roughly the same size. I mean, maybe New York had a few more people than Massachusetts, but they were all roughly the same size. And so this, it didn't really matter. And now you're getting the situation where a guy like Kerry could win. And, and let me put the other thing that's going on that's masking this whole thing. And even the parity issue is, we don't really have that much parity. Uh, the problem is no one's campaigning in California. No one's spending a dime there. It's a blue state, or a red state, excuse me. It's going to be a red state. Kerry could win that place by 5 million votes. If he wins it by 5 million and wins, loses the rest of the country by 500,000, he's going to win the This is what's starting to happen now. And, and, the other thing that's happened is we've gotten so damn good, both parties 
have gotten so damn good at their polling that they write the states off and now the whole fight's down to five, six, seven places. That's where 200 million bucks gets spent versus someone else's 200 million dollars, which forces a real tight race in those states. Um, and the third thing I'd say about parity is the following, because this is the one thing I would outlaw polling if I could do it. First Amendment rights, everything else out the window, because here's what's going on. <laughs> These two parties are not stupid. Oh, people want a patient's bill of rights. So the Republic, they're not dumb, they see it in the polling, you have a Republican patient's bill of rights. The Democrats aren't stupid, they look at the polling, the people want a patient's bill of rights, so you have a Democratic Party patient bill of rights. The American people aren't stupid either, but they're out there busting their rears, trying to put food on the table, trying to enjoy themselves watching the Yankees game tonight. <laughs> and all they know is both parties are saying there's a patient's bill of rights, and they can't tell a dime's bit of difference between, there's a big difference in that bill. But, for the, but, but for, to convey that to, the, to, the, to, the, to people who are all being told patient's bill of rights, patient's bill of rights, with 200 million bucks being spent on both sides in five states, it starts becoming tough with that kind of sophisticated research and message delivery for people to discern different, real differences when they're, when they're there. And I think all these things are sort of masking an inevitable mess where I'm telling you, somebody's gonna win the Electoral College by, not by a few votes in Florida, whether, in, in, you know, in those, but by a couple million votes and the entire country is going to wake up the next morning saying, how the hell did that guy lose the election? Joe may be right on this, but I guess I'm, <laughs> being older, <laughs> I'm not as convinced. It certainly could happen that way, but there are two factors that I think, I can remember in 1968, I can remember a couple other presidential elections when there was enormous amount of hand rigging that because then we had third party candidates who were actually winning electoral votes. Uh, George Wallace won electoral votes. The assumption was it would be thrown to the House of Representatives and of course that would be an outrage and that the American public would be in a state of revolution uh, over that. And none of those things happened. In fact, the Electoral College gave clear answers as to who won the, the presidential race. It did not this last time uh, and it, that complicated things enormously. So, and who's red and who's blue? maybe on the edge of shifting as, as these things turn. I don't think this is just so permanent. It just happens to be we're in a couple of cycles. Uh, because why shouldn't California possibly become into play uh, if you had a different uh, configuration in the Republican presidential candidate and one that was not so anchored in the more conservative side of the party? I mean, who knows? That may happen uh, in a couple of election cycles. The other is uh, this question of it is very difficult, of course, for the American people and any of us to figure out what to believe, but that's a universal in our society with television and commercialization of everything. And so what happens? We all become more sophisticated, unfortunately, about discounting things. And I think what's going on is an awful lot of people are discounting all these commercials, and some of them reinforce what we already believe and want to believe about the other side, so they will buy into them. But, uh, they're, the people just aren't quite as, as I think, manipulable as, we, as the presumption is made about them by candidates and, and other folks. That I guess I trust in the end of their judgment. <laughs> that may be very naive. <laughs> That's not to say you don't, Joe. I'm, no, no, no. Yeah. Well, well, just because I won't overdo this, but I would agree with you about everything you said about Wallace and all that stuff. What I'm saying, what's changed, though, the reason it's more messed up this time isn't because of the American people or either the campaigns, it's because they, we didn't have the fine tune ability that we have today in the way we conduct research and the, and the delivery system to get it. We weren't good at figuring out which 50 states were, I mean, we didn't have, we still campaigned in all 50 states, essentially. both parties mm -hmm. did. And they, you didn't but have a substantial states. You know, I mean, I mean, neither campaign is, and as I understand it, is running national polls at all now. Right. That's not what they're spending any money on. No national poll. They're spending it only on statewide polls. So I think that that is there's certainly a, a truth in that. Uh, well, let's go. Let's see. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm taking up too much time. Good evening. Um, it seems that the blogosphere is still in its diapers. It's just growing right now. We don't know where it's going to go. Uh, right now, people enjoy flipping through all these different blogs, reading them. It's no problem. 
In the future, are we going to see consolidation of uh, lots of little blogs into one big one? Are we going to see the good ones, the powerful ones, the rich ones, push the other ones out of the market? Um, or is, it, is the new media constructed such that we're always going to have plenty of them to choose from? And to piggyback on that, uh, with this alternative media out there, are, will it give third-party candidates a better chance of getting their voice heard and becoming viable candidates? Um, or it's the future of blogs. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you got, if you go to technorati.com, right, um, we're, they track every single blog on the net, or, or at least do the best job of anybody I know. Um, and I think they're up to their four million blogs now, individual blogs on the net. Um, so that's a pretty big swath of stuff to choose from. I think what what happens is you, it, it's the word of mouth about a blog that creates its growth. And so um, I think you're, you're always going to have a sort of democratizing effect in the blogosphere because, um, because of the way that works, the way the word of mouth works on, on, on who's doing something. Uh, and and I, there's nothing about the technology that lends itself to one viewpoint or one ideology. So that's going to happen. Uh, continue to happen. My own view is, yeah, there's, uh, in terms of your third party question, I, I personally have no doubt that one of these two parties is going to go the way of the Whigs like that, and a lot faster than anybody sitting here in this room today or any two of the national headquarters could have, could dream of it happening. Um, and it, it could happen as soon as 2008. Um, if neither party understands that how obsolete it's become and how they have to change quickly, then a third force will, will, will emerge. And, and you only have to go back and look at this urge has been there throughout our George Wallace, Perot in 92. McCain tried to reform the Republican Party from within, or at least try to, and the establishment just crashed that guy faster than you could say go. Uh, Mondale, I was part of helping to do everything we could to crashed the uh, Gary Hart insurgency, Dean, the establishment, and the party crushed it as soon as they, the, and we made some mistakes, but they were out to crush us from the beginning. Um, you cannot continue to push that impulse outside of the two established parties anymore. You, you could do it in the past because there was nowhere to go. You had nowhere you were gonna raise any money. You had no way to build a structure out there and have thousands of people organizing for you. That is over with the blogosphere and the internet. Howard Dean proved you can raise more money than any Democrat in history at the time without any help from anybody in the, in the power structure of the party, and you could put 650,000 people out on the street without any help from them either. It didn't work. You know, I mean, there were still problems with it, but those problems would be solved. I mean, the way you look at McCain as the great internet candidate of 2000, the guy was operating, they were making magic out of nothing. There was no blogs really, there was no meetup.com, all the tools that weren't there. The internet in a year, getting back to sort of the dog ear equation, the internet in a year, it's a, it's a century of change on the net in a, in a year that we go through. We've been through three centuries of change on the internet since McCain ran in 2000. Howard Dean was the embodiment of what those 300 years of change on the net did in terms of the millions of Americans who've transacted on eBay or Amazon, those kinds of things that had to happen for people to be willing to give on the net. Lots of things happened in those three years. By 2008, you guys are going to be looking and you're going to be saying, Trippy was so yesterday. <laughs> and the Dean <laughs> campaign was as primitive as the McCain campaign was. And if the two parties don't understand that empowerment that's happening, and I believe that the media doesn't understand it, and corporations don't understand it, they're just all going to wake up in two or three years and be shocked at, you know, Craigslist is I, demolishing newspapers. I'm sorry, I just, no, I, that's I, right. my I just suspect that competition will cause some of them to understand it and to co-opt it because people like to win. Uh, we've got two more questions that we're gonna wrap it up because we have a important vice presidential debate coming up. Hi, um, this is actually somewhat related to the last question, uh, but this is more about the press in general and the effect that it has on how we think about politics, how we talk about politics. 
not just on the internet, but even the pundits that you see um, on various television news talk agencies, uh, shows, excuse me, but how do you think that's affected the way that we look at politics and the political system? Let me just, 30 seconds from kind of the lowest possible level of politics, right, which is city hall politics. Yeah. Um, you know, in those politics, you fight and then you solve a problem, right? As you go up into this kind of new media attention, the object is to crystallize the fight and reduce the ability to solve the problem, right? So, so it, it seems to me that the, the, that the way the press reports and reinforced by the way the candidates speak, and that's of course a reinforcing cycle, uh, makes the process of governance enormously more difficult uh, than it had ever been before. Well, even, even writ large, if you take that theory one step further, it's we love the horse race. We, we like to pick winners and losers. Um, that's what we do after every debate. It's the, you know, and it, it's done very effectively on broadcast. And then the print press picks up on that, you know, and as usual, we're a little delayed on that. Um, but it's the nature of the beast. I'm not sure that that, um, that is it worse this time around than it was four years or eight years ago. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's always the nature of the media to, to like that, that easy winner and loser thing, and we do it not just in politics, but in a gazillion other ways. I think there's a thing in some of the talking heads I find particularly irritating because of an attitudinal uh, thing that you pick up on immediately, which is either a sneering or a cynical view of every time they discuss a presidential candidate or, a, uh, or any kind of policy move in the Congress, they always seem to be, have a tone of voice or a casting on it like it's the most cynical, ugly, corrupt kind of thing that could ever happen. That's my personal complaint. I have a couple of very prominent names I'd love to put on the table, but I will restrain as the moderator and, and not do that. Oh, somebody else. Somebody else. Yes. Um, this is a question particularly for Mr. Moderator, but any of you can answer. Um, uh, be because I don't live in a <laughs> because I don't live in a swing state, I feel sort of disenfranchised in the presidential election, and I'm wondering why the electoral college system hasn't been changed yet, and if you think it's possible, how that will come about. Well, you may know the American amending process requires uh, very large votes, two-thirds in the House, three-fourths of the states, and that is the fundamental reason. Over the years, there have been efforts to change it. Uh, but frankly, without some kind of crisis, it's hard to get people motivated. And then the difficulty is one side or the other has won or lost <laughs> as a result of that crisis, and their tendency to want to change it is diminished. So it's a very difficult proposition uh, to change it whether you want to or not. I just suggest to you, if you're feeling disenfranchised, however, and you don't vote, you may discover you're no longer in a safe uh, state. You are now in a swing state because a whole bunch of you copped out. Um, there is a very interesting, oh, oh, sorry, okay. yeah, the, the, Colorado? The, yes, yeah. the phenomenon yes, exactly. of exactly. you don't have to amend the Constitution. Right. Each state has the right to determine the way it will um, uh, allocate its electors. Right. And it, it can be done proportionally. I think Colorado is, Maine has already done it? Maine and Nebraska, but there's a, there's a ballot initiative in Colorado to divide the delegates proportionately, which, which people believe is gonna pass. And it would, be, it would be effective in this election. And I believe that that's probably the way, way of the future. I think that's a, what's gonna happen. Yeah, I agree, that could become a major good. movement and that yeah. could significantly change the operation of it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we thank you very much for being with us, and I particularly want you to help us thank the panel for here. Very good. Drunk already. <laughs> we just quit.